Now we must move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And can I inform members that questions 3 and question 7 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr Stephen Moutry. Question number 1, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, EU legislation adopted by the EU Commission on 11 March 2014 states that, in line with the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, payment entitlements should be allocated to the person enjoying decision-making power, benefits and financial risk in relation to the agricultural activity on the land for which such allocation is requested. My Department will act in accordance with that legislation. This means that in future, direct payments which are intended as an income support for farmers should go to those who are actively farming the land in question. This provision is particularly relevant for land led under Conacher arrangements. In general terms, this means that in 2015, when all existing single farm payment entitlements are abolished and new entitlements are established, landowners letting out land in Conacher will not be able to establish entitlements on that land. The principle being that where land is let, the farmer actively farming the land will be the one claiming direct payments on the land. For a supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her, quest, for her uh, answer thus far. Can I further ask the Minister, has she any intention of bringing in a minimum stocking rate to define active farmers? No, that's not something that's within our scope. Um, we've clearly set out, I know people are very active, are very um, concerned to know the, the clear definition of an active farmer, and I've set it out there in terms of what Europe has set down, and we're trying to make that um, available to everybody to see, so people, particularly landowners, can establish it whether or not they're active farmers. But I think the basic rule behind it is if, you, if you're not sure you're an active farmer, in all likelihood you're not an active farmer. So that, if we take that principle. But in terms of clarity, if anybody's unsure, um, they should check the DARD um, website for the Q&A, which is very detailed, and also phone the helpline for, for any support that they may need. Thank you. And I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I doubt even the Minister would be brazen enough to try to claim her department has handled the definition of an active farmer well. Yet again, what should have been a relatively straightforward procedure was overridden with avoidable ineptitude from her department. Can the Minister now tell us the exact implications of the current definition of to Northern Ireland's Conacre system? The Member will be aware that um, throughout the, the process, which was a difficult process, um, we very much fought our corner in Europe in making sure we had as much clarity as possible so we could provide it to our farmers. Um, unfortunately, Europe has been slow in terms of um, the regulations and making sure that all of this is clear. As soon as we were aware of the final definition of an active farmer, which I have um, just outlined, we made sure that local farmers were aware of that. I could give it no sooner than whenever I received it. And I call Mr. Declan Michael Lee. Uh, could the Minister tell us what impact will the uh, active farmer regulation have on farmers who rent land in Conacre? Uh, well, if a farmer has the land at their disposal, um, that means that they've owned or they've taken it in Conacre for the purposes of agricultural activity on the 15th of May next year, 2015, then they can establish the entitlements on that land. And as they would be the claimant, they'll also be responsible for cross compliance on that land for the entire calendar year. There are many, many different scenarios out there, and everybody's situation is different, whereby sometimes farmers own the land, sometimes they rent the land. So they should be encouraged, as I said, to read the Q&A on the website or contact DARD, because everybody's different, and there's certainly not a blanket approach to any of this. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for answers thus far. And just based on your answers earlier, would you, would you agree that a lot of landowners are very, very unsure of what's, what's happening with this? Um, with this, who, by this term, act a farmer, and what more can you do to clarify the situation for them? We, yes, we're aware that um, this is obviously very complex, and, and there are very major changes. And people um, have been cautious about taking business decisions because, effectively, they are business decisions for them. We've updated the Q&A on the website daily, and that was done in line with um, the questions that farmers were asking us. So we were trying to provide as much clarity as possible right the way through the process. I also extended the trading deadline to allow another, an extra month to allow people a bit more time to make decisions. And then, as I was able to clarify information, we were able to get that out there as, soon, as quickly as possible. But absolutely, I, I accept that um, it's a time of massive change for farmers. It's a time of massive change for landowners. But I suppose the principle around active farmer is that supports only go to those people who are genuinely active farming. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Mr. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. There are two major issues which will affect how Pillar 1 monies will be allocated to farmers over the 2015-2019 period. 
These are the transition towards a flat rate payment per hectare and the number of regions designated for administering the direct support regime. We have considerable flexibility around the pace of transition towards a flat rate payment regime through the EU regulation um, that requires that we achieve a minimum level of migration by 2019. The pace at which we move to flat rate is a complex issue and it will affect virtually every farmer in the north. Farmers in all areas, that's SDA, DA and Lowland, rely heavily on that support and there is a concern that a fast transition could be damaging and difficult for many producers. But I also know of many other farmers that want a rapid transition to flat rate. The regulation also allows for more than one region to be established in the north and again there are different views from stakeholders on this issue and there's been much debate on the merits of a two region versus a single region model. Analysis shows that having two regions makes little difference to the overall magnitude of the redistribution of support between farmers compared with a single region model, but it does cause a different redistribution. It could also create more complex, uh, a more complex support regime. So these are decisions which still have to be taken and given the major significance of the choices that are facing us, we need to take the time available to make the very best decisions that we can make, balancing the competing needs of all sections of the farming community. Mr. Joe Byrne for supplement. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Prince Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. When will the Minister and the Department have concrete proposals agreed, and when can they be put to the Executive for agreement in relation to the single zone or otherwise, and the period of transition or otherwise? Um, well, political discussions are obviously ongoing in terms of agreeing these last remaining number of issues. We have um, provided as much clarity as possible on all the, the other issues the other decisions that we've taken and made sure that information is out there. But the sooner we have a political deal on the way forward, the better. We have until August to um, declare our hand to Europe. However, I would like to say that we're in a position that we've taken a decision well in advance of that, um, that August deadline. So we'll work through the process and then we hope to be able to clarify for farmers those remaining key issues. And they are key issues because they are massive in terms of the supports and how those supports will be tailored. So I want to be able to position to do that um, sooner rather than later. And call Mr. Paul Fruit. Sir, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister is right when she says that there are two key issues that could actually damage the industry here in Northern Ireland. And, and given the fact that the, the Minister has even stated here today in her uh, latest answer that a, f uh, a change quickly, an immediate change to flat rate, could damage our farming industry, can she give this House reassurance that that will not be the case? And then how does she counter her claims from her colleague, uh, her, the MEP for Sinn Féin, who said that she wants to have uh, a flat rate immediately? It's so important, because these changes are so major, it's so important that we get it right. It's so important that we don't rush just to um, serve people who want to have a decision today. I wish we could clarify it today, but we are in a political process, and I'm happy to go through that process. These are fundamental key issues that will tailor how supports are, are, are um, distributed across the north. So it's so important that we get it right. Do I want to see a move to a flat rate sooner rather than later? Absolutely. So I support my colleague in that respect. However, we are very reasonable and in taking decisions and moving forward, this is, will um, have major significant implications for some farmers. So in moving forward, what we need to do, I think it's reasonable that there's a period of transition. I think it's reasonable that we take our time and make these decisions and make sure they're the right and, pro and proper um, decisions. Sinn Féin have made it very clear from the taking up this department, this is an economic department, we want to drive this agricultural industry, we have a strong commitment to the agri-food sector and I think that's very evident, particularly around the work that we've done on the agri-food um, end of things. So we're moving forward, we have go through the political process, we want to be able to get clarity out on those remaining um, issues to farmers sooner rather than later, so I'm going to work through that process and, and farmers will know as soon as I have an agreement on the way forward, I'll make sure that that's um, communicated to farmers immediately. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Sorry, I've got a free or last count, Corley, and it's interesting to hear so many people talking about a, a transition period and how long it's going to be, but the Minister will be well aware that in my own county of Fermanagh there's quite a large um, and active support for the work of the, the SDA group. So, um, what would the Minister say to those farmers that highlight the fact that there was no transition period when this system was brought in and they were discriminated against, and now there's people talking about a transition period of 10 or 15 years um, to actually get them back onto the system that would treat them with fairness? See, it's very simple. Any, anybody who who's, um, may lose out as a result of changes um, are concerned and want a period of transition. Anybody that is going to gain obviously wants to see it sooner rather than later. I think the current system is flawed. I do believe that we need to move to a flat rate sooner rather than later. However, I am reasonable in that 
people need time to adjust. We're talking about businesses, people who, who could go under if they were faced with the default position in Europe. And if we are faced with the default position, and a reminder says of the default position, because that will be flat rate immediately in 2015 and a single region. So if there's no political agreement, that's the position we'll be taking. I'm, I want to get a political agreement, but it's up to the partners in government to make sure that that actually happens as well. Thank you. And I call Mr Chris Little. Question number four. I welcome the opportunity to debate the issue of animal cruelty in the Assembly, or I welcome the opportunity to uh, debate the issue of animal cruelty in the Assembly on the 31st of March 2014. And I think it was a timely debate given the number of high profile convictions that were secured recently under the Welfare of Animals Act 2011. I share the concerns of the public and members of this Assembly that the penalties imposed by the courts uh, must fit the crime and provide a deterrent to others who might engage in, in animal cruelty acts. For this reason, I supported the motion that called for a review of the implementation of the Welfare of Animals Act and of sentencing guidelines and practices. I note that since the debate, a prison sentence has recently been handed down in relation to a case of very serious cruelty against farm animals, and this case was investigated by my department, and I find the sentence encouraging. Work on the review of the implementation of the Act is ongoing. My officials are currently developing terms of reference for the review, which will include engagement with the Department of Justice, and I anticipate the review commencing shortly thereafter. Well, Mr. Little for a supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for her answer, and I know that uh, she was as disappointed as anybody in this community at the outcome of uh, some of the lenient sentences that had been handed out recently. Can I ask the Minister if the review will consider the adequacy of maximum penalty for animal cruelty and the adequacy of the current level of resourcing for enforcement duties? Yes, um, absolutely. When, we're going to take a review, when we review, we'll review everything. So we'll take a look at the effectiveness of the Act, we'll take a look at the practicalities, the implementation on the ground, and we'll take a look at even the funding. So I think that if we take a look at the, at the whole gambit of issues that are there, then that'll be, um, I suppose, the most effective way to take forward any review. I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the sentencing is one thing, but the, uh, I presume the Minister would agree that the members of the public are the greatest uh, assets in reporting offenders in terms of animal cruelty, particularly in rural areas. What is she doing to ensure that the public know and understand that where they do report cases, that those cases are acted upon immediately? Councils are involved in the actual uh, work on the ground, and I know that through their, um, their own council websites, through local publications, that they have actively been trying to promote the service that they provide. So that, um, in terms of when we're looking at a review, we can certainly take a look at, is there anything else we can do to communicate with the public? Because obviously we do want people to come forward. And I think that people are very keen to come forward if you look at the numbers of people that have actually contacted the animal welfare officers to report cases of suspected animal cruelty. We're talking somewhere in the region of about 12,000 people to memory. So the fact that, those, that that number of people have actually come forward, I think, is very positive and encouraging that people want to... Um, this is something that they want to stamp out and they want to help the animal welfare officers do their job also. Call Ms. Rosie McCorley. Can I ask the Minister who is responsible for the enforcement of animal welfare abuses of non farmed animals? Well, the PSNI has got the responsibility for enforcement in respect of wild animals, fighting animals, or animal fighting, and welfare issues where other criminal activities are involved. And then councils have responsibility for enforcement in respect of non farmed animals such as domestic pets and horses. Councils have nine animal welfare officers to enforce the Act right across the north. And the powers in the Act allow those animal welfare officers to take a range of actions to address any, any animal welfare case. And that includes providing advice, giving a warning, issuing a legally binding improvement notice or prosecution. And the circumstances of each case will determine the most appropriate action. And it's important that the PSNA councils and my department are involved in the enforcement of the Act as it provides a new duty of care and allows inspectors to issue improvement notices for animals that are not being cared for properly. This would not be appropriate work for the PSNA. However, should the PSNA wish to investigate and prosecute any, any animal welfare complaint, the Act provides powers for them to do so. And importantly, only the PSNA can make arrests in any matter where an offence has been committed under the Act. I call Mr Alban McGinnis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I note what the Minister has said, and I'm sure she's quite sincere in relation to her concern about animal cruelty. But what has the Minister done in relation to expressing disquiet and concern about the leniency in sentences? 
to the judiciary, to the police, to the public prosecution service, to animal welfare organisations and anybody else, including the Minister of Justice. Well, I have discussed the issue with the Minister of Justice. I've also written to the Lord Chief Justice to um, express my concern at the sentencing. That is a particular issue. If the Act is fit for purpose, which by all, um, I suppose, by early assessment would be that it is, however there may be areas where we can strengthen, but if the Act clearly allows for tougher sentencing, then we need the judiciary to also follow through on that. And in the case, the recently highlighted case in East Belfast, I think that was particularly concerning the leniency of that sentence. So I've written to the Lord Chief Justice to express that and to ask for consistency. I am encouraged um, recently, again, since the East Belfast case, that there's been another um, uh, enforcement case taken in relation to farmed, or farmed animals, and the sentencing in that case was, wasn't as lenient. So I think that's something that's encouraging and hopefully reflects the attitude of the judiciary in going forward. I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm glad to come back to this subject again, particularly after the cross Kennan problem with Belfast City Council. But does the Minister accept that it was wrong of her predecessor to dismiss the concerns of many, including this party, that her department was not offering councils enough direct support and guidance, although she's just indicated she'll give more guidance, but following the decision on the animal welfare responsibilities, will she consider giving additional funding to councils? And that should then help out the ratepayers, of course, end up footing the bill. Well, I mean, I think that the reason my predecessor started the legislation, the Welfare of Animals Act 2011, the legislation we have in place is very strong legislation, particularly comparable to, if you look at what England, Scotland and Wales um, have in place. So in terms of the legislation that she brought forward, she very clearly listened to the views of stakeholders in, in developing that legislation. But as I said earlier, in terms of the review and the assembly motion which we had and the debate that we had, I said I would take a step back and take a look at all what's in place um, around the enforcement role, around the role of councils, and obviously funding is obviously one, another area which will be considered as part of that overarching review. Thank you, and I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five. Responsibility for regulating the slaughter of farm animals lies with the Food Standards Agency. District Council Environmental Health Officers, on behalf of the FSA, investigate allegations of animals slaughtered illegally from a public health perspective. However, my department has responsibility for investigating any animal health or welfare breaches associated with this illegal activity. Although suspect cases are uncommon, where illegal slaughter is suspected, enforce, enforcement officers from the department's veterinary service work closely with the police, the FSA and the relevant environmental health office, adopting a multi-agency approach to dismantle such operations and take appropriate enforcement action. Well, Mr. McKinney, for thank supplement. You, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And can I ask her how successful has her department been in identifying any traceability elements of the animals involved? Well, unless the member is referring to a particular case, I can't comment. Um, but I think it's very key that FSA, um, in terms of the slaughter of animals, are very much in the lead, although my department will work collectively with the other agencies, so the police, the environmental health officers, and ourselves. We have a central enforcement team in place that work and take the lead in some instances, but I think that um, it's very key that in tackling any sort of illegal activity, and a lot of these activities are criminal activity, and the damage to the reputation of the wider meat industry, which is something that um, we're obviously concerned about because we have farm quality assured beef, we have something we can stand over, and illegal activity such as this damage the, the, the reputation that we have. So we want to make sure that we can um, stamp them out where possible and work collectively to do that. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I realise the Minister said that her department isn't responsible for investigating illegal slaughter, but it was her AFIS system within the department that has reported 12,500 cattle stolen or missing over the past four years. Where does the Minister think they're going? Well, this is a question you may put to those people that are involved in that illegal activity. We are working very closely with the PSNA because any of these sort of instances that occur. Um, are usually involved in a wider criminal gang. There can be other aspects to it. So quite often the PSNI are in the lead and we're content to work with them and use our services. And our central enforcement team are a very effective team on the ground and they work very effectively with the other agencies because it is a collective effort to, to, um, in terms of trying to eradicate something that's obviously a particular problem. Where the cattle are going to, it's a legal activity and we'll try and... Uh, expose it where we possibly can. We've had a recent case where it was exposed and investigations are ongoing and we hope to see more of those as the close collaboration um, continues. 
and I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister uh, tell us or outline what the implications this all has for the food safety supply? That's why I think it's very important that um, we do all we can to tackle this problem because it does ruin the, the reputational um, aspect to the, what we have. And what we have is fully traceable. We can stand over it. Any meat that's slaughtered through appropriate um, manner is fully traceable, of high quality, and is second to none. The only issue we have is where there's illegal activity, and we want to drive that out because it does cause that reputational damage. And we'll have to do that, as I said, with all the agencies and partner agencies involved. And I call Mr. Jonathan Craig. And I hope to be able to hear your question. Question number six, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. The single foreign payment scheme entitlements are denominated in euro. The vast majority of claimants in the north elect to be paid by sterling, paid in sterling. The exchange rate used in 2014 <coughs> will be the rate that's recorded by the European Central Bank on the 30th of September this year. The department will make a press announcement at that point to confirm the rate that's going to be used. The single foreign payments received by foreign businesses in 2014 will also be affected by the rates of financial discipline and scale back of entitlements. These rates are set by the European Commission and will be announced in the autumn. Foreign businesses will be informed by letter in the autumn of the value of their entitlements after scale back has been applied. <coughs> Mr. Craig, for supplementary. Thank you, and uh, thank the Minister for that answer. I take it those dates will, um, the Minister will ensure that those dates are actually met by the Department because critically this uh, dictates the income for farmers throughout the province and you know, they need some certainty with their banks that they actually have an income which makes them viable. And if the rates change dramatically from previous years, will you give the House the guarantee that your Department will do everything in their power to try and minimise the impact on our rural farming communities? This is a process which we go through every year and farmers know when to expect. That they, they know that every year the um, exchange rate is set in September by the bank. <coughs> they also know that um, as soon as in autumn, so shortly after that, when Europe confirms their um, element to it, that I will make that public and we will inform them all in writing. It's the same process every year. There's nothing new in that process. Mr. Patsy McGloan. Uh, Kerma, good for you, last young colleagues. We have selection Ira asked the Friday Gennig show. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for answers up until now. Uh, just uh, would the Minister be in a position to provide us with some detail as to those single farm payments which were due in the previous financial year, that's the 2013-14 one? How many of those remained outstanding for payment at the commencement of this financial year? Um, in terms of last year's single farm payment, 99.5% have been paid. Um, the only remaining cases are those people that, for reasons of probate, there may be legal reasons, they might not provide bank details, they're the only people that are, are outstanding. But we far exceeded our targets. We paid four months earlier than ever before this year. Um, we had some issues around remote sensing, however, those people were still paid um, earlier than ever before. And I'm actually really pleased to say that today, um, this year's single farm payments, we can confirm we've now received over 40% online. That was something that I asked um, the farming industry to, if more people applied online, I can pay them quicker. And so I'm delighted that we've actually went more than double the number of people that have applied online. So it's a very positive news story, and hopefully then we'll have a very positive impact on next year's payment um, targets, and I think we'll far exceed them again. Thank you. And I will call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Question number eight. Relocation of the Forest Service headquarters from Stormont to Fermanagh is progressing on three fronts, where, who and when. We continue to develop an estate management strategy, and this is pointing to Enniskillen as the preferred location for Forest Service headquarters. We have commissioned DFP Central Procurement Directorate to report on the feasibility of accommodating staff by, refurb by refurbishing Enniskillen House at Killyhelvin. This would locate Forest Service within the existing DART Direct Service there. We have sought information on the preference of staff who currently work at Stormont and will use that information to develop a staff transition plan. I do not expect that anyone will be required to move if it does not suit and we are developing a strategy to deal with that. Over time, I believe that many of the jobs will be taken by local residents and it will afford an opportunity for those people to work in the public sector at the highest level. All of this work is pointing to a timeline that will see Forest Service headquarters substantively established in Fermanagh by June 2015, subject to business case. Mr. Flanagan for supplement. 
Gorry Mugat, the free last country is going to be a slash in Iris up to Ragri. I thank the, the Minister for her answers and the, the positive news that, that finally we're going to see the Forest Service um, substantially relocated to Fermanagh by June of, of next year. It's a long time coming. But can the Minister um, clarify um, what number of jobs we're talking about here? Because um, there is some question marks hanging over what number of jobs will transfer to Fermanagh. And perhaps the Minister could clarify that for me. Yes, um, we're talking about 61 Forest Service posts that have been identified as headquarter jobs, and then a small number of additional posts associated with plant health policy have also joined Forest Service, and they'll also be headquarter based as well. So the target um, operating model this stage, subject to establishing the optimum number of plant health posts, and inclusive of posts already based there, is about 78 posts in total. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Following the, the scale back from the original decision to relocate the Forest Service to Fermanagh, can the Minister give a commitment that uh, she won't seek to do the same with the Rivers Agency relocation to Lockery? I think the member must be confused because there is no scale back. The move to Fermanagh is going ahead, as is the fisheries moving to County Down, as is Rivers going to Lockery and headquarters going to Ballykelly. So we're firmly on target. We're building all the work that we need to do. This is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. This is about giving people access to civil service jobs. It's only right and proper, and I'm glad that my department is leading the way. Thank you. And I call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, question number nine, Principal Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> In the case of Pillar 1, producer support, I have already announced a number of important decisions relating to entitlements, eligible land, active farmer, greening, regional reserve, the young farmer scheme, and capping. However, a number of key decisions remain to be taken. As I said last Thursday at Balmoral Show, we have to keep in mind the significance of the choices that we make. We're talking about almost an allocation of almost two billion of taxpayers' money over the remainder of this decade. That has to be done carefully, wisely and fairly. We need to be mindful not just of the allocation of CAP support, but of the potential bureaucratic burden and the risks we pose for ourselves in whatever choices we make. Given the importance of these remaining decisions, it's so important that we get it right. Political discussions are ongoing in relation to these remaining key issues, and it's my intention to bring my final proposals to the Executive in coming weeks. I am, of course, mindful of the 1st of August deadline to notify the European Commission of our implementation plans, and it's most certainly my intention that we'll have an agreed CAP Pillar 1 structure before that date. Order. Uh, I just remind the House that the Speaker has uh, made a very clear ruling that conversations, loud conversations, shouldn't be taking place on the benches. And I would ask members to respect that ruling, as I can hear these conversations quite clearly from here. And I call Mr Elliott for a supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I hope I wasn't referred to in that because I've been sitting here on my own for quite a while. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I appreciate uh, the Minister has touched on, on some of these issues in relation to this question in, in an earlier uh, question, Principal Deputy Speaker. But uh, can the Minister give us some more detail at, at what stage uh, the discussions are with uh, herself, other political parties, other representatives of the Executive and other stakeholders uh, in regards to finalising the CAP proposals? Well, the Member will be aware, given the significance of these um, decisions and changes, we have had massive consultation. We have had probably the biggest ever response to consultation. We have had numerous <coughs> public meetings. We have had halls packed um, right across the north in terms of people wanting to have their view heard, and I am very happy to, to listen to all those views. I have confirmed quite a number of decisions. However, as I said, there are a few remaining key decisions to be taken, and I am actively working through that process um, as we speak. I hope to be able to confirm decisions sooner rather than later. We certainly do not want to be waiting to the August deadline. We would like to confirm for farmers um, much, much uh, in advance of that date. Call Mr. Wilson for a supplement. I think I've probably heard most of it. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for that. Does the Minister accept that, despite what she has said about extensive consultation, that what farmers now require is confirmation of the arrangements which are going to be in place for payments? Uh, especially uh, around the, the, the single farm payment and the, the, the cap reform proposals, and that many of them 
now find themselves in a position where they, they face a, a, an uncertain financial future because of the way she has dillied and, and, uh, and dallied on this particular issue. And if she really does want to give comfort to farmers, will she get a paper to her executive colleagues so a decision can be made? Yeah. Order that ends the, the period. <laughs> for, it was so long. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Could the um, uh, could the minister tell, tell us had she had um, much engagement with the farming community uh, during the course of the Balmoral Show and what was her feedback from it? it the Balmoral Show was, was fantastic and the weather was kind to it and it, it's the second year at that new site and I think that um, it was evident for all to see that uh, it was very much something that was enjoyed and something that's actually going to be built on year on year. The numbers this year were fantastic again and the engagement was, was excellent I have to say I spent um, most of Thursday there and the engagement was, was excellent with both the farming community and the wider rural community and all the businesses that actually had an opportunity to exhibit uh, what they had to offer. So it was very positive. Cap reform is obviously the topic of the day, which you would expect. I launched um, quite a number of, um, or celebrated quite a number of very successful rural development programme projects, which again was very positive and I visited many stands. But no, all around it was a fantastic, successful show. For uh, at the show, Minister, you announced the Young Farmers Scheme. You're intending to implement that. Could you give us any assessment of what impact that will have on the farming community? Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, when we're looking to the future, we need young people in the farming industry and we want them to remain in the farming industry. So at the Balmoral Show breakfast, I was able to announce that um, we've decided to allocate 2% of our regional sealant to the Young Farmers Scheme. So that's a payment that will be 25% of the total um, direct payments, regional average. Um, which is approximately about €84 Euros per hectare. So I know that's something that um, is very much welcomed by young farmers. When I, after the, the dark breakfast, when I met with the Young Farmers Club, it's something they were very, very pleased about and, and very delighted to have that announcement. I also had announced um, information in relation to the um, uh, educational requirements, and um, we've gone some way to addressing the concerns that were set out, particularly around whether or not we should have a Level 2 or a Level 3 qualification. And again, that's something that's been very positively welcomed. So this is all about trying to make a sustainable farming future. And it's about supporting our young people to stay in agriculture. I think the fact that so many are wanting to get involved in food and agriculture courses is testimony that they want to stay in, in farming. So this is an opportunity for me. And I think, as I said, something's been very positive to be able to support those young farmers financially. Mr. Trevor Lunn is not in his place. So I call Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, one of the uh, most important instruments for the development of the rural economy is the Rural Development Programme. Could I ask the Minister when will it be finalised so that the rural community will be able to benefit from the new programme? Well, we're actually working our way through that process now. Again, we had major consultation on the Rural Development Programme, and we've set up a stakeholder consultation group. And that group's looking at all the proposals that we've set out. It was something, again, that people showed particular interest in in terms of the responses to the consultation that we had. We know our European allocation. We know that we have been allocated 227, um, just over 227 million euros. And I'm looking towards then how we, in my department and the executive, can actually match that funding so then we know the total scope and the final scope of the Rural Development Programme. Supplementary from Mr. McGuinness. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I do thank the Minister for her, her very clear answer there. But uh, in the last part of her answer, she referred to the co match funding. When will that uh, be agreed by the Executive in order to have a meaningful uh, rural development programme going forward? Well, I'm hopeful that will happen um, very soon in the near future. I think it's important that we hit the ground running with the new programme. We don't want any delays. So we're working up proposals based on different financial allocations, but hopefully we'll have discussions with the executive in the very near future around the going for growth strategy, which will um, again help me be able to decide on final allocations of the rural development programme and then final programmes. But we're certainly not waiting until that happens. We have been involved with the stakeholder group. We're talking through the possible ideas depending on the final um, budget settlement that we have. You and I. 
Prime Minister, Kenneth Minister, could ask the Minister, can the Minister outline any, uh, any support she intends to put in place to support the beef sector during these difficult times? Yes, obviously there, we have concerns for the beef sector at this moment in time, and what we want to see is a strong, profitable red meat sector here, and we want to do everything that we can to be able to uh, achieve that. Farmers have to um, receive a fair price for what they produce, and only whenever that happens will we have fairness in the supply chain, and only in that, when that happens will we have a sustainable red meat sector. Um, I'm obviously very sympathetic to the very challenging issues that are facing the beef sector currently, and I've met representatives of the sector um, and have instructed my officials actually to, to work on how we can shape the new rural development programme, what supports we can provide for the beef sector um, through that rural development programme, and we're working our way through that now. It's obvious um, that if we're going to have a sustainable beef sector in the future, we have to look at new markets, we have to look at the export opportunities, which is why we've been visiting places like China, we've had OFM, DFM visiting um, other areas as well. So we need to um, be targeting those markets because if we're going to um, grow the exports, grow the sales that are set out and going for growth, then that beef sector needs to be supported to do that. And I'm obviously very keen that the new rural development programme supports that, that industry going forward. Mr. Milne for it, supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Can I ask the, has the Minister spoken to Minister Coveney in the South uh, to discuss her concerns? Yes, I regularly engage with Minister Coveney to discuss things, and actually, coincidentally, um, just about a half an hour ago, I had a phone call with him. Um, but basically, we're talking about how we can collectively work together to deal with issues, particularly around the issues around nomadic cattle, which is a term that I hate, but it's um, how the industry have, ter have termed um, cattle that are um, either being born and reared in the, in the north and then slaughtered in the south or vice versa. So there's particular challenges for that beef industry and he and I are, are keen to work together. <coughs> One of the areas that we actually discussed today were, was around going to Europe to ask them to recognise the fact that we have a distinct situation here. We are very different. And I think it's important that we're able to market our, our produce as Irish produce uh, when, when people want to, when businesses want to. So we're going to go to Europe together to collectively make our voice heard. We're also both involved in a round of engagements with retailers and um, the large supermarkets around their specifications for the meat industry because, again, that's something that's obviously causing um, problems for the types of, of meat that's coming forward. So quite a, quite a, a, a lot of work is going on between myself and Minister Coveney both in the NSMC, but then also outside of that too. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure that the Minister is aware of the significant concerns that, that there are from uh, livestock markets uh, in relation to various cattle uh, cr residency criteria that are being imposed by both DARD and the abattoirs. And uh, I'm wondering what action uh, the Minister is, is taking to help resolve those issues in particular in relation to those livestock market owners? Well, I would firstly like to correct something that you've said. It's not, nothing's been imposed by DARD. These are commercial matters outside of the department's remit. There are um, criteria that have been set down very clearly by the processors. I have met with their representatives. I've made it very clear that I do not support it, that this is challenging for the industry. To bring something in with no communication with the industry quite simply isn't good enough. When people have bought cattle at high prices and are now stuck with well, they they nowhere to go to have them slaughtered. So it's not good enough. I've made my position very clear on that. I'll continue to engage with those people and I intend to do that as part of um, in a previous answer I talked about I'm doing a round of meetings with the retailers. We also be doing rounds of meetings with um, the processors also because I think it's key that if we're going to have sustainable industry and going forward, these people need to not take these decisions on their own without consulting with the farming industry. It's just simply not good enough. Commissary Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I do welcome the Minister's uh, opposition to, to the imposition of, uh, of these issues. And the Minister did indicate that she's having discussions with the retailers. Is there any indication that the retailers are actually in support of the processors doing this, or are the processors doing it of their own volition? I think there's possibly a mixture of both, but um, until I've met them all, it'll be hard to, um, to confirm that. Um, but um, as I said, I intend to meet them, to impress on them that some of these requirements are, are nonsense, particularly around cattle. That there's a traditional trade across the island. People buy in certain counties and, and would always come here for slaughter. So this is something that we don't need to disrupt. This is a nonsense. It's all the same beef. It's all fully traceable. So there's no, there's no areas for concern. So that's the message that I want to clearly put to them whenever I do the round of meetings next week. 
Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the strategy to reduce bovine TB in herds? Okay, well, the member, oh, well, the, my officials actually have been with the DARD committee over the last number of weeks to update them on where we're at with the proposals. It's quite a detailed proposal on what we're trying to do, but obviously, TB is a very complicated disease. There's no um, quick fix, I wish there was. But we're working our way through the TVR research um, proposals, which are quite um, detailed, and I cannot go into them all now, but I'm happy to provide that to the member in writing. But basically, we're actively trying to tackle the wildlife issue alongside um, all the other work we're doing on our EU eradication plan. Good. Ms Cameron, for a supplement. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, could the Minister tell me when the, um, the TVR scheme will be rolled out on the ground? Um, well, we actually um, had the executive agreement last week, so we're able to go out and start our budget, budget set survey work, which is actually commencing immediately. So it's actually maybe already on the ground. If not, it will be over the next number of days. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Gordon, I got the pre last Concordia. Can I ask the Minister uh, if she could provide us with an update on the new rural development uh, programme? Um, as I said, considerable progress has been made in developing the new plan for moving forward for the 2014-20 rural development period. And as part of the public consultation process that was carried out, there was considerable, considerable interest in the consultation, and we very much listened to all the views um, that we received. Um, the stakeholder consultation group was also established last year to provide a forum for the key stakeholders to discuss the influence uh, and influence the development of the, new, the next programme. I know that's something that's been very beneficial both for them and also for the department because I think it's important that we learn lessons from the current programme, that we try to cut down the red tape, that we try to make things, things simpler, particularly around businesses applying for funding um, where potentially it would be the same application process for £1,000 as it would be for £20,000. So there are things that we can iron out and I'm very grateful for the work of that stakeholder consultation group in um, assisting us in trying to iron all those things out. We now know what our European allocation is in terms of the EU funding of 227 million. However, um, in the absence of being able to transfer any funds from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2, I await the outcome of the Executive's discussion on going for growth to decide on a final budget for the new rural development programme. Mr Brady, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. I was going to ask her what uh, stakeholder consultation and um, engagement had taken place, but I think she's answered that question. Gormila Baigat. Thank you. And Mr. Jim Allister is not in his place, so I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Uh, the Minister outlined uh, in, in answers to a previous question about the cap reform that it could run to August. Is she intending to have any discussions in the course of the next 10 days to try and resolve the matter? I'm always open for discussions. The discussions are ongoing at a political level, and as I said, I do not want to see the deadline of the 1st of August or us running to the 1st of August, I'd rather see decisions taken sooner rather than later and provide the clarification that farmers are asking for. Mr. Campbell, for supplement. Uh, if the discussions uh, aren't clarified and concluded until after the House rises in uh, the beginning of July, what plans does she have to coordinate both with the House and with farmers uh, directly in the aftermath of the House rising? Well, obviously, I hope we're not in that position, but there are urgent procedures in place and there are mechanisms in place to deal with that if we happen to be in that position. Order time is up.